So we are starting with the webinar now. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants joining the webinar from across the globe from different time zones. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all our speakers and all our participants for the webinar of Global Smart Grid Federation on GSGF report on electromobility in smart grids, state of the art and challenging issues worldwide. Moving ahead, let's take a glimpse at today's agenda. Welcome address and announcement of the new name of Global Smart Grid Federation will be by the chairman of GSGF, Mr. Reji Kumar Pillai. Report release and presentation will be by the lead author of the report, Professor Marc Petit. He is also a professor at Centrale Superlec, France. Special address will be by Professor Willett Kempton on GIV technology and policy implications. Professor Willett Kempton is a professor at University of Delaware, USA. It will be followed by an open discussion and question and answer round. The closing remarks and vote of thanks will be by Ms. Valerie Ann. She is man managing director at Think Smart Grid France, and she is also the vice chair of GSGF. I request all the participants to please queries all the questions for question and answer round in the chat box. We will try to cover maximum questions and our speakers will be answering them during Q&A session. Also, I request all the participants to please mute yourself and keep your videos off so that our speakers can smoothly deliver the session and each one of us can hear them clearly. For your quick reference, presenting our esteemed speakers, Mr. Rajikumar Pillai, Professor Willett Kempton, Professor Mark, Ms. Valerian. Now, I would like to invite the President of Global Smart Grid Federation, Mr. Reji Kumar Pillai, for the welcome address and announcement of the new name of Global Smart Grid Federation. Mr. Reji Pillai is the President of India Smart Grid Forum since its inception in year 2011. He is also the chairman of Global Smart Grid Federation since November 2016. He is an internationally renowned expert with nearly four decades of experience in the electricity sector in diverse functions covering the entire value chain and across continents. He is spearheading a mission to leverage technology to transform the electric grid in India and to provide 24-7 reliable electricity supply to every citizen at affordable cost. Mr. Pillai has played a pivotal role in formulation of the Smart Grid Vision and Roadmap for India. Thank you, Sneha. I think, I think Thank and you. And greater standards. Now I would like to invite Mr. Pillai to please come and address the audience. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's my great honor to welcome you all for this uh, unique uh, platform to release one of our working group reports. Uh, in the past working group report, we used to present release on the side events of some major events like European Utility Week, Distribute Tech, uh, such platforms. Typically, we used to get 50 to 70 people maximum uh, for, for and it used to be hard copies of the report which we used to uh, release there and thereafter the soft copy would be on our website. But this is the first time a report which we are releasing online and we are so delighted that we have people from around the world over 700 people from more than 50 countries have registered for this webinar and this is becoming truly uh, global the, before we get into the today's report i take a minute to talk about a uh, global smart grid federation uh, this is an umbrella level organization comprising of uh, smart grid associations from different part countries uh, set up in uh, uh, 2010 in september 2000 oh, it's exactly 10 years actually it, it, the organization was set up in washington dc uh, it was uh, initiated uh, the concept of gs 
GF was initiated by US Department of Energy as well as the Gridwise Alliance, which is a smart grid association of USA. And there were about seven founding members and India was also one of the founding members along with uh, many other uh, countries which were members that time and some of them are still our members. Uh, over the years, last 10, 15 years, we have been talking about a major change in the electricity sector. The grid is changing, the energy mix is changing, everything on the grid. 100 years, the grid remained same, but now everything is changing. That is what we have been talking about last 15, 18 years with the advent of smart grid movement, which started sometime in 2003, 2004. However, last since we have seen the whole world has changed, the whole society has changed. Everything today we are doing on digital platforms. Digitalization, which has ha which happened in last six months, is something which in the business as usual scenario would not have happened in, in particularly in developing countries uh, in next 10 years. The, the utilities, all the, the banks, all businesses, which were always performed with hard copy. They want, wanted a letter on a letterhead with a signature and a rubber stamp. They are all today happy with the email. The paperless working which COVID has ha made it happen in six months would not have happened in BAU scenario even in next 10 years. So the entire world, our utilities, everything is changing. Now, next coming years, you will see a much bigger profound change the way we work and we live and our utilities run. And another point I like to underscore, all this communication we are able to do, the remote working we are able to do, maintenance of operations and assets which we are do, able to do remotely, all because there is electricity, a reliable supply of electricity and communication have become the real lifeline of the society post-COVID. And people have realized that. And our co-workers, electricity co-workers around the world have been striving to provide this lifeline, electricity supply, reliable electricity supply to everybody, including health workers, as well as communication systems to make sure that the, the society work, whatever economic activity, which is their work, uh, that, that has been a splendid work which has been happening around the world from uh, developing countries to developed nations. Electric utilities have done well. And I like to take a minute to clap. Everybody clap for all the health workers. They all forget about what the electricity workers, our uh, compatriots around the world do. So with that, let me come to, uh, again, back to the GSGF. The en energy change which has been taking place, the, the energy transition or the the, uh, the revolution which has been taking place uh, made us realize that uh, it is not just the grid, it is the entire energy ecosystem. So we have changed the name uh, early this year to from GSGF to GSEF, Global Smart Energy Federation, which will encompass all sources of energy and making them smart, cleaner, is the, uh, or, or the agenda and objective of GSEF and uh, we try to maintain everything with minimum change so our logo also has gradually changed the new name from today onwards GSGF will be known as Global Smart Energy Federation and GSEF however our website and many other uh, tools will remain uh, our social media handles will continue to remain the same while we will <clears throat> go for the newer ones this uh, working group report which uh, uh, think smart grid uh, taken the leadership and uh, professor mark petit done work last year over a year with uh, input from several other gsgf members uh, contributed to this report and i'm so happy to release it today today is a very significant day in electric mobility because today the electric vehicle stock has taxed 9 million exactly five years before in 2015 it was just 900,000. This numbers doesn't include two wheelers and three wheelers. Excluding two wheelers and three wheelers, the basically the cars and the buses, when you add up together, it comes to 9 million today. And this 10 times growth has happened in last five years. So electric mobility has come of age. And with post COVID, where people have seen a few days of automobiles out of the road, the quality of the air becomes significantly better, which we have seen in Delhi. 
uh, Delhi uh, is considered to be the most polluted city in the world for the last several years. Two weeks, automobiles were out of the streets. From last week of March to first week of April, the air quality in Delhi came to very much acceptable. We could see blue sky uh, in 15 days. So earlier people used to believe that it will take years and years to clean up polluted cities like Delhi. But we have seen with the lock lockdown after COVID, this is reversible and that too, the faster, less than a month, you can clean up cities. So the, the recovery plans of most cities and countries the electric mobility is going to be a cornerstone in the recovery plan of this one. The, the report which has been, uh, which uh, the, my uh, co presenters will be talking about the author and also Professor Kempton. We are so honored to have Professor Kempton today with us, who is considered to be the father of electric mobility. He talked about uh, vehicle grid integration some 40 years ago or 50 years ago. In 1970s, we started reading about it, when it will happen, the electric grid and the automobiles uh, integration. So those days, nobody even heard about V2G technologies. So both of them will be talking more about the technology part of it. Uh, I just like to take another minute of yours. The transportation sector is the one which is going to have the profound changes in the next five to 10 years. One thing is the electric mobility, which is going to completely outpace the millions of jobs from the traditional automobile sector. And next will be autonomous driving. The, the same electric vehicles are going to be autonomous, which will be driving around 22 hours or more in a day. Today, your typical automobiles, you drive for two hours and 22 hours, it is parked in expensive real estate, whereas autonomous electric vehicles will be transporting people from in one place to another place, maybe 20 to 22 hours a day. The total number of vehicles will come down. The density of vehicle on the road will come down. And it, it's going to be a major change, which is an un, unimaginable proportion. And the next change is going to be the, the urban air mobility or the, the aerial transportation. Today, uh, from Gurugaon, which is on the outskirts of Delhi, or from Noida, or, or any, for that matter, outskirts of the city, to the center of the city takes hours and hours of driving with the aerial transportation that will be reduced a few minutes. And we, our latest research and our studies says that by 2025 to 2030, urban air mobility is going to be commercialized. It has already been experimented last year in a couple of places and it is trial runs are happening in many other places and <clears throat> this is going to be commercially introduced in five to ten years in most places that you will drastically reduce traveling time the road congestion the road accidents and what is interesting about this changing revolution including the ur urban air mobility is that all these flying devices are going to be fueled by electricity we have to find technology, we have to find business models, we have to find means to charge all these flying devices, which is going to be a much bigger challenge. And the business of electricity is going to get more and more interesting and sexy. Uh, today's uh, paper, we are going to talk about electric vehicles and the smart grids. With this, I have the honor of uh, inviting and uh, Professor Mark Petty, who is the lead author of this report, uh, uh, Sneha, you can introduce uh, Professor Petit and then uh, he will unveil the report and also he will make a presentation about the key findings of this report. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So for the report release and presentation, we would like to invite Professor Mark Petit. He is the lead author of the GSGF report and a professor at Centrale Supale, France. Professor Mark Petit, uh, has done his research uh, basically dedicated to the electric power system, which includes power quality, smart grid, flexibility, integration of EV in the power system. He is involved in the Armand Peugeot chair dedicated to the economy of electromobility. He is also the head of the power networks research group of Jeep's lab that is involved in the flexibility from EVs, fault detection and location in power grids 
HVDC system, real time stimulation, and microgrids. He is also a member of Scientific Council of Think Smart Grid Associ Association. Now I would like to invite Mr. Mark Petit to please come and address the audience. Hello to all of you and thank you for, for the introduction. So now I will share my, my screen. Uh, Is it okay? Yes, sir. We can see the screen and hear you very clearly. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, the objective of uh, this presentation will be to uh, to give an overview of the, of the report on which we have worked on uh, uh, during several months uh, to, to produce uh, this document regarding so to electromobility in smart ways uh, and to make a small uh, an overview of state of the art and uh, also to point out some challenging issues worldwide. So uh, as an introduction, uh, as it was uh, recalled by the Reggie Kumar, in fact, uh, the electric power system undergo very deep changes. And uh, the, the changes are mainly driven by policies for emission reduction. So it's that uh, the objective is to uh, to increase uh, the renewable energy sources, but also to increase the low emission vehicles, so mainly the battery electric vehicles and also uh, plug-in electric vehicles. And so uh, renewables have, uh, have increased, of course, for, for more than uh, uh, 10 years now, and, uh, and uh, regarding to electric vehicles, it is more recent. Uh, so in the electric power systems, we, we have more uh, distributed also energy resources and uh, and also more variable energy resources that is a, a characteristic uh, of uh, of these uh, renewable resources and we are also have to to face with uh, changes in the power system regarding to the physical characteristic of the system such as a system with less physical inertia Due, uh, due to less electrical machine in the, in the future. And so for the operators, uh, the, we can say now that the grid operation becomes more and more complex. And, and uh, we also have to, and the operators also have to, to operate their grids and the, the, their assets uh, closer to the physical limits. And smart grids, ICT and smart grids should enable the operation closer to the physical limits. And in the future, and it begins to, today, and uh, uh, an important uh, issue regarding to, uh, to the operation of the grid will be uh, how to, to take advantage of the fl flexibility of uh, some uh, resources. It can be uh, generation resources and uh, or load resources. And so the flexibility will be at the heart of the evolution of the, uh, of the power system in the, in the future. And also storage. Uh, because now it is clear that storage uh, is not a dream. Uh, we know, the, of course, the, the bulk storage with the pumping hydro system, with the, with the dams, uh, but in the future, we'll have more and more distributed energy storage, like batteries and uh, flywheels, for example. So uh, as, a, as a background, uh, we see that, uh, we, that uh, electric vehicles, the battery electric vehicles, uh, plug-in hybrid vehicles are growing, uh, and uh, this growth of uh, electromobility, uh, uh, if we consider, uh, uh, it is in, a, in agreement with the, with the European uh, Green Deal for the, tra for, for the transport. And also uh, recently, uh, due to the, to the, co uh, to the pandemic, uh, in fact, uh, electromobility uh, uh, appears to, to be uh, an important uh, pillar for the Europe's economic uh, relaunch, for example. And so, uh, in the future, electromobility will become uh, an important part of the smart grid because it, uh, it will uh, bring uh, new storage capacity, and uh, we, we need storage uh, uh, due to, for, uh, uh, to compensate the variability of uh, some uh, generation. And but and uh, the, uh, the storage and the electromobility through the storage will 
will have, have some capabilities for good services. And uh, now we see that uh, the technology for doing that uh, is coming, is uh, almost ready, as it will be proved by uh, the, uh, the talk of uh, Professor Clinton just after. But uh, some barriers still exist. Uh, and uh, typically uh, regulations, uh, barriers, for example, that we have to, to overcome. So here on the, the, <coughs> the cover page of the, of the, of the report. And so this report uh, is uh, organized in uh, five uh, chapters and uh, more than uh, 40 references. Uh, references can be reports, but also uh, uh, academic uh, papers or re more research papers. Uh, so the, the, the five uh, chapters here, the first one is, uh, is, is dedicated to, the, to some figures, to recall some figures about the, the deployment. And deployment, it, uh, it is regarding vehicles, but also charging points, and also some uh, issues regarding some objectives that are uh, given by the, by the public policies. Uh, the second chapter uh, is dedicated to the, uh, to the group of, um, uh, of electron mobility uh, for the power system operation, but uh, not only, not, uh, only impact, but also opportunities. And so, in the, in the third chapter, we will introduce, we will discuss about the, the flexibility uh, that has to be harnessed and uh, has to be valorized if we uh, want to, to take advantage of the batteries inside the, the vehicles. But uh, to take advantage of this flexibility, uh, some requirements are, are, are necessary, such as the standardization, uh, but also the, the market design and, and the policy. And uh, so for, for, to, to complete the, the report, the, the, the chapter four uh, presents some demonstration projects and, uh, and can be uh, worldwide. And uh, it can be a project for sometimes only uh, V1G. So it means only one unidirectional power flow from the grid to the vehicle. Uh, maybe it is what we call, can call a smart charging, but also a V2G uh, project where the vehicle can uh, inject power into, into the grid. And so the, the last um, uh, the last chapter is dedicated to some recommendation that we can uh, read in different uh, reports uh, worldwide uh, to, uh, to enable the, uh, the development of, sm uh, of smart charging and uh, vehicle to wheel or what sometimes what we call the vehicle to wheel. Uh, so uh, now we will uh, look at a little bit uh, in more details uh, the different chapters of this report. And so the, the first one is dedicated to the deployment, some figures about the deployment. Uh, and for that, uh, he, uh, we, we, we can get some data in the, uh, in the outlook of the IDA that is published every year. And we can observe that uh, we have a growth of the deployment of the, the vehicles. And uh, uh, last year, in, in 2017, it was plus 2 million of uh, vehicles. And in 2018, it was um, between uh, 2017 and 2018, uh, the growth was two, 2 million. And uh, in uh, 2019, the growth was uh, 2 million again. And as it was said, uh, by the end of uh, 2020, uh, we should have more than 9 million of uh, electric vehicles uh, in the world. And we can observe that we have two uh, ge geographical areas that are leading, uh, China and uh, Europe. But uh, even if we, we are in a growing market, we, we need to, uh, to, to understand that, in fact, uh, the market share of, of the electric vehicle is still uh, low uh, because it is less than uh, typically uh, five, uh, Five percent, and uh, but there is uh, only there is in fact one exception that is uh, Norway in Europe, where the the market share of the electric vehicle is more than uh, forty percent, uh, uh, now uh, close to fifty percent. But uh, we have to understand also that it is uh, due to uh, 
to more than 20 years of public policies and incentives uh, in Norway to, uh, uh, to help the, the deployment of electric uh, vehicles. And uh, for the future, uh, the growth should, uh, should continue. And uh, we can see that uh, many countries worldwide are, uh, have announced uh, some targets for 2030 or 2025 or 2035, depending on the country. And uh, if we analyze the target, we can see that uh, the objective will be to have a number of electric vehicles in stock uh, in the range between 10 and 20 percent. Uh, for typically for private private vehicles, the the spe uh, special case of course is uh, Norway that has a target of uh, one hundred percent. And uh, the, the increase finally uh, it not only it is uh, helped by public policy but it will be also helped by some uh, restrictive access for the internal combustion engine vehicles in the city centers from uh, twenty thirty. We can see that, uh, in fact, uh, from 2030, uh, many uh, large cities uh, will, uh, will ban, in fact, the ICE vehicles uh, from the city centers. So, uh, regarding to the deployment, we can also observe uh, recent, uh, since uh, some years uh, that the, the size of the battery that is embedded in the, in the vehicle is increasing. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the many cars and many, uh, we can say, small cars that with the usage that were more dedicated to uh, small trips in, around city centers uh, had batteries of about uh, 20 uh, kilowatt hours. But now, uh, the, often the, the minimum value of the of uh, 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 is there any problem? Yeah, we cannot see the presentation. It just dis disappeared one second back. Uh, uh, I don't know what's happening now. Uh, ah, yes, that's okay. No. Okay. Is it okay? Not yet. I'll just again give you the rights. Yes, the presentation is now uploading. Over to you, sir. So we can start. Your presentation is visible to us. We cannot hear you, Mr. Petit, we cannot hear you. Message him or call on his cell. Yes, sir. is on but we can't hear you yeah so can you try speaking something yes uh, do you see uh, my we can hear you sir you can share the ppt and we can continue okay but uh, okay so you you see my screen right? No, the screen uh, is not yet visible. Okay, so I will try to uh, to share. Sorry for the technical issue. Is it okay now? The screen is visible, and we can hear you, sir. You can continue. Okay, so now I am in the, in the slide twelve. Uh, so, regarding to um, to electromobility, uh, 
in fact, we can observe that uh, the size of the battery is increasing now from 40 to uh, what, about 100 kilowatt hours. And, and this is uh, important because finally, uh, uh, with, a, with a higher battery, you will have a higher range. And we know that the, the limited range can be an anxiety for, uh, for the users, and so it can be a barrier for the EV adoption. And in the next line, uh, 13, uh, so uh, we also have the deployment of the charging points that can be a, a AC charging point or DC charging point. Uh, but uh, for charging point, we can observe that we have several uh, standards. And, uh, and sometimes it, it can be, uh, and it is often uh, uh, a trouble so when you want to, to easily find uh, the solution to charge your vehicles. And, and uh, we have different uh, standards, uh, type 2, CHAdeMO, CCS Combo, etc. And uh, regarding to the, to the EVEC, uh, uh, mainly they are installed in private uh, uh, places. Uh, and mainly at home, but it can also be at work. Uh, but we can observe regarding to, to, the, to the figure that uh, the um, more than, in fact, uh, more or less more than 95% uh, of, of the, uh, of the ch uh, charging points are private charging points. And regarding to public, it can be uh, in the city or on highways uh, sometimes. But and, uh, for the charging point deployment, uh, the the policies for, for example, in uh, Europe uh, recommends uh, about 1.1 uh, charging point per EV. Uh, so if we consider, for example, that 90% uh, of people, of users, have, a, have, a, have an easy access to have their own charging point, it means that 0 0.2 charging point uh, has to be, uh, would have to be a public charging point. But in the future, uh, there will be a battle, uh, we can say, say something like that, for the fast charging points. Uh, there is a race to increase the power. We can, we have, if we look at uh, the announcement of, the, of Tesla, of a consortium like uh, Ionity, for example, uh, where announcements are up to a power of uh, more than two, 200 kilowatts and up to uh, three. Uh, 350 kilowatts, for, and, but mainly for, uh, for pre premium cars. And so such power uh, could be uh, um, critical for, for the stability of, uh, of the power grid and mainly for the distribution grid. So the, the second uh, uh, chapter of the, of the report is uh, dedicated to the, uh, to the impact, or to the integration, finally, of the electromobility into the power system. Um, and when we deal finally to, to power system, uh, the question is, uh, do, we, do we talk about uh, energy or do we talk about uh, power? Because it, finally for the power system, it is a little bit different and uh, power is more critical. And uh, power can be um, at a global scale or at local scale. So global scale, it means for, for the transmission uh, system, for the, glo the global balancing of the system. And at a local scale, it can be more for uh, voltage issue, for current issues. And uh, in the report, um, we have put a, a table uh, with some figures uh, of different countries, uh, different uh, area, uh, power system areas, where we compare the, the global energy demand, the, the peak power of the system, the present peak power of the system in summer or in the winter, and considering uh, uh, one million of uh, EV, uh, what would be the energy ratio and what would be the, power, uh, the, uh, the peak power ratio. And it can be seen that uh, the impact is more important for the, for the power than for the energy. Uh, of course, the figure here for 1 million EV, uh, of course for 10 million EV, it would be much more important. And uh, so uh, regarding to the, to, the, to the green and the distribution to, to the more local uh, impact, so for the distribution we choose, uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we may have some uh, voltage or current constraints. Um, so sometimes some risk of, of local peak load uh, or voltage drops. But uh, the, the impact uh, regarding to voltage or current will depend on uh, different parameters for which we have some uncertainties. For example, uh, some questions remain, such as uh, how will EV be adopted by the users? 
and how the users will use the, the EV. So it means uh, how many kilometers they, they will they drive and uh, how and uh, what will be also the geographic deployment of EV because uh, uh, maybe you, you can have some areas where you have a more important deployment. And so uh, in that case, you can have local, uh, locally, you can have more important impact. And so uh, regarding to the important part will be also the, the charging uh, the charging behavior. It means, for example, uh, the, ch the number of uh, charging stations per week, because in fact, uh, with the increasing size of the battery, you will not have to charge every day. It is something that we, we have observed, we, we have tried to, to model uh, Two figures here, and uh, typically uh, time for for urban uh, usage of the, the vehicle, uh, uh, mainly uh, one or two uh, charging stations per, per week will will be uh, will be enough. And uh, the final issues uh, the user will be uh, the capability or the um, the willingness for participating in some good services. And uh, so. Uh, Electromobility is not only uh, it must not be seen uh, only as a drawback. Uh, it can be an opportunity for the system because it will uh, bring a flex. It can bring flexibility uh, if we see the the vehicles and the fleet of uh, electric vehicles as uh, virtual stationary storage. Uh, here we say virtual because in fact uh, the EV it is a mobile battery, but uh, it is a mobile battery. But uh, uh, when it is a plug, of course, uh, it becomes a stationary battery. And uh, the, the different uh, relation and uh, between the vehicles and the, and the not only the grid but the, the environment uh, sometimes is uh, called as a vehicle to X, uh, considering that uh, the vehicles can deliver energy to to an isolated load to the uh, connected home to a connected building, and also directly to the grid. So uh, and so. Uh, Finally, uh, V2G is only uh, a part of uh, more glo globally what we call the V2X. And uh, the, the potential for the potential for the for flexibility uh, and for so for this uh, virtual storage uh, will depend on the, at which scale you will uh, make the analysis and which scale you consider. It can be a uh, low voltage grid scale, it can be a medium voltage grid scale, or it can be a high voltage grid scale. And so here, uh, you, for example, if you consider a low voltage uh, grid scale and uh, with a, um, an area of with uh, 50 uh, electric vehicles and a 50 kilowatt hour battery, uh, finally the, the virtual, uh, oh, sorry, the, the virtual uh, storage capacity uh, can be uh, around uh, two megawatt hours, and uh, the the maximum power that could that could be exchanged between the fleet and the the grid uh, could be up to uh, more, a little bit more than 100 kilowatt, uh, considering a uh, 3.3 uh, charging point kilowatt. So uh, the different services uh, could be uh, could be delivered for power or power plus energy. It depends. And uh, different uh, type of uh, services will be presented just after. And uh, the report uh, uh, put a, make a small focus on a on a case study that was done recently uh, last year, in fact, and published last year by uh, the French DSO RT. Uh, to, the objective was to to analyze the impact of the, the development of electromobility at the scale of the the French transmission system, the French electrical system, and uh, it is interesting to to analyze the, the parameters that were that have been considered, such as, for example, the the mobility needs of the user, the number of electric vehicles, the the, the size of the battery, the charging point access at home or at work, and the charging point power between low power, higher power charging point. But also the the frequency of the of the charge and do you charge uh, every day or every two or once or twice a week and the the charging strategy that you will uh, adopt do you charge during uh, for example peak of batteries etc and so uh, the some mod, uh, some simulations were done considering different uh, scenarios 
the base case being a, a case where you only have a dump charging, but also a different case we considering a unidirectional uh, peak of this tariff, and uh, with or without good services, it depends. And uh, good services that were considered were, in fact, uh, what we call the frequency containment uh, participation to the frequency containment reserve for the for the frequency regulation. And also, the, um, some scenarios where uh, people uh, uh, use their vehicles for vehicle to home, vehicle to grid, and sometimes for uh, um, uh, for smart um, energy management uh, um, uh, when they try, they want to combine uh, the local PV generation with uh, the EV charging. The, the third uh, chapter uh, is, um, in fact, dedicated to flexibility. And the question here are uh, what are the challenges and the requirements to, you know, to, to harness uh, this uh, AD flexibility. And an important uh, part uh, will be the standards. Standards, finally, it is something that is mandatory. Sometimes when, uh, when we do research, we, we often uh, for, uh, forget uh, the standards. Uh, uh, because standards are necessary to enable the thing. And uh, so for more than 10 years, uh, uh, discussions uh, have been made, and now standards are exist. Uh, exist. Uh, different standards uh, for communication uh, with EV, between EV and EVC, between EVC and operators, etc. And uh, so you have different type of standards. And uh, an important one uh, is uh, standards, uh, the common standard between ISO, ISO and uh, IEC, uh, so the 1511.8 that was uh, initially uh, set for, for smart charging of the vehicle, but also in the, in the next version for being able to do some vehicle to grid application or between. So standards are also important for. Uh, Thing to uh, sign up to to set the requirements for for power quality and also for for protection and protection uh, is at the heart of some consideration some uh, issues regarding to the vehicle to grid because uh, when you want to operate your vehicle as a vehicle to grid finally you introduce your source in the system not only your route and uh, we can see that. Uh, um, uh, to to be able to, to to operate the flexibility the potential of flexibility given by uh, EV uh, aggregators will be important and uh, if not uh, mandatory finally uh, because aggregators will enable uh, the market access and they will enable the the compliance um, uh, with the the, the market uh, finally requirements. Um, because sometimes you have some typical, you have some specific threshold to, to enter into the market. And if you don't do the aggregation, you will not be able to, to enter into the market. So it is something that is discussed in the, this report. And uh, we, uh, we make a, a short review uh, about the, the possible markets for, for, for valorizations. So they are mentioned here, such as, for example, frequency regulation, balancing, but also capacity market, et cetera. Regarding to uh, to local markets, not we observe presently that it it seems that uh, in the future it's not it will not always be some markets but more some call for tenders uh, for the DSO to be able to to get some flexibility when they need. It. And uh, we uh, we mentioned some uh, important factor regarding to flexibility that will be the characterization of this flexibility. For example, the direction of the flexibility draws flexibility for. For, uh, for increasing the, the demand for decreasing, so for what we call up and uh, or down uh, flexibility, or is it a V1G or unidirectional or bidirectional flexibility, so V1G or V2G. And uh, the, the characteristic of the flexibility regarding is it uh, do you deliver energy, do you deliver power, etc. And uh, also the, the, the final point here is the, the predictability of, uh, of the flexibility, so what is the uncertainty of the availability of the flexibility and the, the response time of, also of this flexibility, but also just to, to match with uh, the different markets. And so um, different, the, the markets are a little bit detailed in, in the doc, document, 
And uh, we can observe what is underlined here, that either for balancing or for distribution, often uh, you have, uh, if you want to, to participate to a grid services, you have a minimum bid. And this minimum bid, uh, that's why uh, maybe you, you may uh, uh, need a, an aggregator. And depending on the, on the minimum bid, uh, it will define finally the, the size of the fleet to be able to, uh, uh, to, to bid on the market. And so this, uh, this chapter uh, concludes with uh, the, uh, the position of uh, national regulators. Uh, and the, 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 we can see that worldwide uh, regulators are interested, in, of course, in storage resources. And they, they said that uh, they, we have to consider the, the storage resources for, for the electric power system. But uh, as electric mobility is a, is a type of uh, storage, it is important to accelerate the implementation of smart charging strategy because uh, finally smart charging is the first step of, of uh, flexibility. And uh, different uh, issues are mentioned regarding to V2E. Uh, some, for example, some protection issues, but also the, some declaration issues because uh, you have uh, if you have a charging point that is bidirectional, uh, then you will have to declare it uh, because finally it means that you have a, a potential source inside your, for example, inside your phone. So uh, globally, we can observe that uh, often rules uh, are proposed for stationary storage, but the idea is will be to to extend the the rules to uh, electric vehicles that can behave as uh, uh, resource uh, sources for the two powers. So the, the fourth part uh, of, the, of the report is uh, dedicated to demonstration projects. And so we can see that uh, we have, there are numerous projects in the world about smart charging and v 2 if and it is continuing to increase them to be able to, to test the, the technology and also to test the business model around the technology, because it is not only technology for technology, you have to find a, a business model. And so that's why some projects are, are, are built. And so we can observe that we have a transition from a lab project to what we can call large fleet, pro, uh, with project with large fleets and projects with uh, real users. So now we can see, we can, in, uh, we can finally begin to enter the users into the project. And so some project will be uh, will be uh, explained by uh, uh, presented by uh, Will Clinton. So I, I will skip it. And so the the final uh, part of the of the report is dedicated to recommendations that are formulated, and uh, we can observe that um, yeah, we have put in red some important point. Uh, for example, the recommendation for enforcing the, the smart charging at uh, low voltage level and uh, with different uh, means, finally. It can be with the tariff, it can be with the direct control or not. Also, uh, recommendation for developing the bidirectional capabilities of the vehicles and also of the charging point, but also of the, of the vehicles. And, and regarding to, for, to vehicle to grid the system, uh, some recommendations for the characterization of the, of the battery of this model, mobile batteries behind the, behind the meters. And of course, uh, if it is clear that technically we, something can be done, uh, valorization of the battery uh, is important, so we have to test the, um, the business model. And so uh, <coughs> recently, um, different recommendations were, were done by the EAC, so in US uh, Electricity Advisor, Advisory Committee. So the um, recommendations were, were given to the US DOE. And uh, anyway, once again, we, we see some things about uh, standards, some things about the grid impacts, about the business model, about the V2G project. And uh, finally, some uh, recommendations by uh, the team of uh, Willet Campaign, but uh, he will give you more details after. So as a conclusion, uh, we can see uh, if we consider uh, three points, we have technological issues, we have regulation issues, and we have user issues. 
So we often, we, we're going to technology uh, solution, we can say that solution has been developed and uh, some solution will be uh, commercially available very soon and the solution more or less are ready to be embedded into the electric vehicle, into the vehicles. But uh, for that, uh, the, um, the business model has to be proven to be uh, profitable for the, for the ecosystem. And uh, regarding to the regulations, uh, uh, rules are needed for, for the mobile storage and uh, rules are also needed for bi-directional system. And for the user, finally, uh, the question will be the willingness for, of the user for participation in smart charging strategy, for part participation in vehicle to grid approach. And so the, the services have, have to be, will have to be proposed in the future for the user. So that's uh, the end of this uh, presentation that gives an, uh, an overview of uh, what uh, what you, you will be able to read in this report, uh, because the report will be available uh, available very soon. And uh, I don't know if the question uh, can be asked now, or maybe just. We will take. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. We will take the question answer at the end, and okay. uh, the report is already on our website. It can be downloaded the link is there in the chat box uh, back to you sneha yes sir so i would like to thank you uh, professor Ma thank Ms. Uh, professor mark petit for uh, all the valuable insights and details of the report and for la launching the report uh, and uh, for being the lead author of the report uh, the report can be downloaded from the link which is also pasted in the chat box you all can copy the link from the chat box and uh, refer the report. Moving ahead, and now I would like to invite Professor Willard Kempton for the special address on GIV technology and policy implications. Uh, professor Willard Kempton is a professor at University of Delaware in the College of Earth, Ocean and Environment, and also a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He is an internationally renowned expert in clean energy and clean transportation, particularly in the field of, of offshore wind power and electric vehicles. He, is pioneer, he has pioneered technology of vehicle to grid V2G, which is uh, capable of storing excess energy, uh, which most of you are aware about. Professor Kempton conducts research into offshore wind turbines as a, as a source of energy. His focus includes the viability and efficiency of offshore wind farms, as well as gauging public support and public opinion. I request Professor Kempton to please address the audience. I'd also like to thank Professor Petit for that excellent uh, presentation, which gives an overview of the entire field. Um, so <clears throat> this presentation today was uh, prepared both by myself and by uh, Sarah Parkinson, who is on the line, if there are, are questions for her. Um, I will be speaking through it today, but it's a work by both of us. <clears throat> The concept, which uh, uh, many of you may know about, is to have a, an electric vehicle which is integrated with the grid, a uh, grid integrated vehicle. And it's a system, it's not just the vehicle, it's, it's uh, the charging station and communications, aggregator, as Professor Petit mentioned, uh, and standards and laws and so forth. Um, <clears throat> the concept is that electric vehicles already have a battery and power conversion equipment for grid storage, and uh, they're parked, uh, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Pilani mentioned, uh, that they're parked most of the time, 95% of the time, typically near a plug. So to provide grid services, we may need only minor adjustments to what is already there for a transportation device. 
change the charger to bidirectional, charge and discharge. Uh, and that would be the vehicle to grid part. Sometimes power goes from the vehicle to the grid. Uh, also add controls and signaling uh, so that this response to the grid, not just by time of day, it's not like a solar device. It provides energy when the sun's shining. This is by command from storage unit. Uh, and the last important piece of the concept is that we have aggregation. There are many reasons for aggregation, but in particular, the car, the electric car was purchased for the purpose of transportation. So that has to be prioritized. Uh, so with aggregation, we can meet the trip needs of any individual user, but at the same time, meet the aggregate need for balancing reserves uh, or local adjustments on the distribution grid because uh, we can draw from one car if another one unexpectedly leads. So that's the basic concept. <clears throat> How does it work in practice? Uh, the car has been driving. You see on the right, maybe the battery is very low, uh, very little uh, energy left in the battery, perhaps. Uh, you plug in. Uh, the priority for the control systems is first we have to fill up the battery. Maybe, maybe we only need to fill it part way. Uh, we don't need to fill it all the way, but we need to be sure there's enough uh, in the battery for the next possibly unexpected trip. <clears throat> when there's enough in the battery, then we can make money by selling grid services to uh, the distribution uh, uh, system or maybe to the transmission system. Or behind the meter, we can save costs by using stored energy to displace peak consumption or on, on peak uh, power charges. <clears throat> Finally, uh, you're ready to drive, perhaps because the car and the system has learned typical driving uh, for the weekday or weekend where, when you are, or perhaps you've used a mobile application shown on the left to set it. I'm taking an unusually long trip tomorrow morning uh, at eight o'clock, so I'll need a full battery then, even though rarely uh, those of you who drive EVs, you know you rarely need a full battery uh, for the next trip. <clears throat> so that's the concept, how it would work and how the user would see it. <clears throat> now let's talk about storage. As Professor Petit mentioned, more and more generation is variable generation. Uh, and so we will need storage uh, and we'll need more transmission as well. But today we're talking about storage. So. If you want to buy storage just to use for electric grid storage, that's expensive. I'd recommend Lazard, uh, Levelized Cost of Storage, uh, that's published each year. Uh, and here we see roughly looking at the top of the top three lines on the graph, the top three sections. Uh, in front of the meter storage, large scale storage is less expensive. Behind the meter, small scale storage on the bottom three sections. Uh, is more expensive, but generally it's between $1,000 a kilowatt and $5,000 a kilowatt for storage. Uh, so that's expensive. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have already EVs coming onto the system which have battery and power electronics in them. So uh, calculations which are attached as an appendix to this presentation shows, and even on demonstration projects where things are more expensive, our calculations are you can provide storage grid storage for 220 uh, some dollars per kilowatt as compared to a thousand plus uh, for purpose built storage. On OEM production, that is automobile manufacturer production, uh, that might be down to around $50 a kilowatt. So we, we're interested in grid integrated vehicles in B2G, not just because it's an interesting concept or it's fun to do some new engineering, but because it's dramatically less expensive for storage. <clears throat> and there are ways to increase the economics. I'm not going to go through every detail in all of these slides, but you want to use the onboard charger with AC charging rather than DC, much lower cost, uh, bidirectional, higher revenue, higher power per car, also higher revenue. You want consistency of the driver plugging in when parked. Some EV drivers will say, oh, I, you know, my battery is good for three days. I'll only plug it in uh, some days, not others. For V2G, we obviously want the user behavior. Uh, another topic, Professor Pete mentioned uh, the user behavior. We want them to learn 
well, I should charge it in whenever I'm near a plug because there's value to that in its revenue. And importantly, which I'll expand on a bit, we need policy changes, uh, also mentioned by Professor Petit, for market access. <clears throat> There's a stack of values, and there are values to the transmission system operator, the distribution system operator, and behind the meter, the three categories you see on the left of this table. Uh, we'll go through all, but you can operate. It's a stack of different types of values. Some conflict with each other, but many can be used at the same time. Whereas arbitrage, buy low, sell high. Uh, if it's if there are rates which in, encourage this, maybe a, a, at low usage times the electricity is less expensive per kilowatt hour. At high usage times, it's more expensive. So with a uh, controlled grid integrated vehicle, you may be able to buy and sell in that way. Uh, so here we estimate in the second co column of, of uh, revenue figures, maybe between fifty and three hundred dollars per year for that. Uh, that's available um, <clears throat> thousands of hours per year. Uh, there's 8,760 hours in the year. Uh, a large fraction, maybe a fourth of those, you can make money with arbitrage. Um, <clears throat> and perhaps we're at the same time selling uh, regulation, frequency regulation, which is one of the ancillary services. That can be bid every hour of the year, 8,760 hours a year. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, but and the value is quite a bit higher, uh, but we can do both of these at once because we can take a few hours a year uh, to do something else uh, in, in addition to regulation because that's bid on an hourly basis. So we can bid tomorrow. Uh, there's going to be a very, very high value period, perhaps when we know there'll be a high charge for electricity, we wanna do arbitrage on those hours. So we just don't bid regulation. So there are many different ways here. You can see many different possible markets. So this is giving a little bit more uh, detail to the point that uh, Professor Pete made. So this is already operating commercially uh, in many areas of the world. Uh, I'll just quickly look at a couple of pictures of some of the operations at the University of Delaware. Uh, one of the demonstrations Professor Pete mentioned, we're operating as a demand side resource in the PJM regulation market. Uh, you can see charging stations here in cars, and uh, if a VDG car plugs in, uh, then it can do VDG. This one on the right, uh, on the on the left, you see a car which is uh, a, a just a not you know not a controlled car. It's not a grid integrated vehicle, but the charging station will do managed charging, referred to previously as uh, V1G, uh, as as a way to provide some value, although not nearly as much as if you can do it by direction. Uh, so this is an example market. We're earning 1,200 per year for a grid integrated vehicle, more like 100 a year uh, for just managed charging. <clears throat> uh, in Denmark, uh, there's an ongoing market. You can buy, you know, you can buy a car from the Nissan dealer, sign up with uh, uh, Nuvi Denmark, uh, and uh, be earning money here. Uh, we are in the primary reserves market. Uh, this is being managed by the Nuvi, Nuvi uh, APS, uh, which is the Danish branch of uh, Nuvi, Nuvi Corp. Uh, and they're earning about 1,600 euro uh, per electric vehicle per year on the uh, primary reserves market. <clears throat> UK, also commercial grid integrated vehicle fleets uh, installed 2019 and 2020. Uh, these are in London uh, and also uh, Royal Bor Borough Greenwich. Uh, these are, you know, real drivers, uh, as in Denmark, these are vehicles that are in use every day uh, in, in the UK here, where we are providing multiple grid services, uh, and these are projects by NuviCorp. I say we, when I'm talking about NuviCorp, we consult for NuviCorp, we have, uh, we have provided some technology for them. Um, and then, uh, again, in, in the US projects, uh, we have uh, stationary storage shown here, in addition to the uh, the cars uh, on on, uh, on chargers providing services. But we do uh, work with heavy vehicle manufacturers as well, uh, bus and uh, class eight truck you see here on on the right. Uh, so that's uh, these are AC three phase charging. Uh, so this is using the uh, SAEJ thirty sixty eight standard, uh, which is similar to the uh, sixty one eight fifty one standard for three phase uh, charging. <clears throat> So the OEMs that are participating by OEM, I mean original equipment manufacturer, that is an automotive uh, manufacturer, uh, B 
BMW has provided vehicles for demonstrations. Honda has pre-production EVs. Nissan Europe, those are just commercial uh, EMP 200s plus Leafs. Uh, and you saw them in some of the pictures. Those are uh, used for DC uh, V2G, but that's just, you know, you can just buy it commercially and you get the charging system. So that's no longer, you know, really a demonstration. It's a commercial product. Um, <clears throat> Lion Electric. Uh, from Canada is selling uh, school buses with ACV to G built in. Um, BYD, uh, Chinese manufacturer, has a demonstration of 28 transit buses in uh, London. Uh, those are 40 kilowatt ACV to G. Uh, Bluebird has DCV to G buses there in early production, but they will be at, as a full, you know, full product line uh, production, I believe, early uh, early next year. And uh, Renault. Is uh, mass producing uh, uh, an AC V to G capable vehicle. I should say they have an early production run, which is being tested with customers. They, I believe, their plan is to have mass production of that next year. So this is a, 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 a you know, and not quite at scale yet, but beginning to be a commercial enterprise. Um, and most of these vehicle manufacturers are really worries about the effect of warranty and so forth. These companies have studied the effect on the battery, and they have, uh, in every case, decided they still offer a full battery warranty. Um, and this, there's some very good detailed studies of this now. You have to manage it, you have to be thoughtful about it, but it does not have a significant effect on battery uh, lifetime if you cor correctly manage uh, the use of PDG. <clears throat> It's a five-year lead time for production. These heavy vehicles actually can be faster uh, from the concept of production, but for the mass-produced light vehicles, the uh, manufacturers really wanna know that there's going to be a market there. So this is a matter of regulation. They, uh, the uh, states uh, need to say, uh, you know, here's, you're gonna be able to do this. We're gonna allow it. There's standards for it now. We accept those standards. Uh, and you'll be able to earn money. Otherwise, why would more and more auto manufacturers do this? We have the early innovators here you see on the screen, but this won't be widespread until governments say, yes, this is going to be uh, something that we will allow to work. <clears throat> so to get further commercialization, we require this regulatory certainty for interconnection and for market access. So I'm gonna use some regulatory examples and I'll go through them fairly quickly give you the concept, but not necessarily all the details of the regulations in the US. Uh, so four key actions here. One is you need to clarify uh, that storage technology recognizes both stationary and mobile storage systems. This is also a point made by Professor Petit. That is GIVs. So uh, this actually, believe it or not, is not allowed uh, in many cases. And uh, <clears throat> Second is address interconnection barriers and allow expedited interconnection when it's a small kilowatt resource added to a grid, which is able to, to manage uh, a, a higher load and some back feeding. Um, the expedited interconnection lowers the cost of interconnection and speeds up the interconnection. It's very important. Um, a third, we need to uh, address inappropriate interconnection, interconnection certification requirements by having uh, standards which are appropriate for DC versus AC. I'll look, come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then allow credit for export. So if you have bidirectional vehicle to grid, uh, as well as managed charging, then you have to have some way of being compensated at the local level for going through the meter uh, for back and forth and flow. Otherwise, the costs there overwhelm whatever value there is. Um, uh, this is a, a little more detail on expedited interconnection. Uh, on the interconnection certification, uh, we, 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 we need to be able to recognize either the converter, the AC to DC bidirectional converter, may be in the charging station, as seen in the diagram at the bottom here, the yellow arrow pointing to it. Um, or it may be in the car. If it's in the charging station, then the appropriate standard are uh, IEC or in the US UL standards 1741. <clears throat> if the chart, the converter is in the car as seen in the diagram at the bottom here, 
uh, that is AC charging, conversion of AC to DC going into the battery, conversion back DC to AC going out of the battery is in the car, then it's an automotive standard that needs to be used. That's SAE J372. <clears throat> then the credit for export uh, is not a means of compensating for this storage. It's a means of not penalizing so much that the other parties that are compensating you that the revenue is not swamped, is not dwarfed or overcome uh, by the fees as you go back and forth. <clears throat> Uh, so, summary, current status of vehicle to grid and grid integrated vehicle systems, they can provide an array of benefits, it can benefit consumers who may get part of the revenue, rate payers, that is other utility customers, because this is a lower cost way of providing storage, and it's a benefit to the grid and reliability uh, and improved voltage control and things like that. Uh, so, from the consumer's point of view, it brings down the total cost of ownership of the EV. There's a revenue stream when the car is parked. Uh, from uh, the uh, utility standpoint, the second bullet here, you turn an uncontrolled influx of demand, that is new EVs coming in, plugging in at some time of day that maybe is already high load, you turn that into a controlled load. Uh, third, you mitigate the variability of high integration of renewables because you have this low cost storage resource coming onto the system and it's highly distributed. So it can be used for storage for solar on a local distribution feeder, as well as being used uh, for balancing wind, which may be coming in uh, from the transmission side. <clears throat> Again, it's a cheaper, readily available storage resource for grid services. And there is a stacked set of benefits, a stacked grid of services, each of which can provide some kind of revenue. <clears throat> Technology is proven and maturing. Some OEMs are producing VDG enabled vehicles and some aggregators are already realizing market value and earning revenue from this. <clears throat> so the regulatory recommendations that I'll close with, to realize the full value of the technology, regulators have to act to remove barriers to storage. Again, summarizing, modify the storage definition to include mobile storage, second, review and potentially raise fast track interconnection pathways. Third, modify inappropriate safety standards so that they include uh, not just an IEC or a UL standard for a stationary uh, power converter, but also SAJ3072, which is safer and more appropriate for a mobile power, uh, power uh, storage system. Uh, fourth, ensure the technology is not penalized at the retail level through some kind of mechanism like credit for export. Another way to do this is net metering. Uh, we think credit for export is a more general uh, way to do that. <clears throat> Fifth, work with utilities to design and implement phase zero implementations of the technology so that there's more experience for more utilities. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Campton, for a very, very insightful presentation. Now we will move ahead for the question and answer round. I will request my colleague to please share the Q&A PPT so that uh, our speakers can address the questions. Well, do you want me to, if there is some questions on the, on the chat? No, we have a PPT ready for the questions which were on the chat. Okay. And uh, we will be displaying one by one all the questions. And it's taking a few minutes to just upload. So moving ahead with the question slide. Parul, if you can change the slide. Thank 
problem? So it's just taking few few seconds, few more seconds. Meanwhile, I would like to inform everyone that the report is presented by the report is presented by uh, Think Smart Grid France and Miss Valerie and from Think Smart Grid France will be addressing the audience after the Q&A round. So starting with the questions for Professor Mark Petit, there are three questions, uh, Professor, you can address them. Over to you, sir. <clears throat> I think Professor Mark Petit was on mute. I am just unmuting him. So can you can you uh, speak something? We can we are not able to hear you. Yes, I, I can give some uh, uh, some response to to the question. First to question sure. one. And so regarding to uh, to what we call virtual inertia, in fact, because uh, it is possible to to control the power electronic converters and just to have a, a sources. Uh, that behave like uh, a traditional uh, electrical machine. It is some, there are some research on, about such topics, uh, and uh, in that way uh, we deal with uh, uh, virtual synchronous machines. And so uh, uh, it is something that, uh, that, that is possible uh, if we consider uh, PV, uh, PV generation, if we consider storage systems. So why not considering uh, a control of the power electronics or of the embedded batteries uh, to contribute to to the inertia of the system? After the question is, can we imagine a market of inertia uh, for for the valorization? And um, uh, so the, the the question number two. Uh, uh, regarding to, to f uh, flash charging, so it means uh, charging at a very high power, uh, we can say that it is, a, it is the beginning, uh, because first it was mainly announcement uh, with uh, the Ionity consortium that announced uh, charging power up to 350 kilowatts, but presently uh, there is uh, almost um, no, maybe maybe only one car, the, the, I think the Porsche, the electric Porsche, uh, is able to to accept a very uh, such a very large power for for the charger. Uh, but the, it is not the case of the of the other one. Uh, but the objective, in fact, uh, for behind that, is to reduce the the time for for charging, um, for in, in the perspective of a long distance trip, for example. If we imagine that you have a, such, a, such a premium car of more than 100 kilowatt hour of, uh, of battery, if you want to charge in uh, less than 30 minutes, uh, you will need a power of more than 200 kilowatt. So um, we, we, we have observed that there is a, an increase uh, of, the, of the battery capacity and if you don't want to, to have a very long charging time, you have to increase also the power. So after, we can say, what is the, the best limit for the battery capacity embedded into, inside the vehicle? And then we will be able to, uh, to define an acceptable uh, charging time and then an acceptable power. And after, what, will be the, what, can, uh, what can be accepted by the distribution grid? Because uh, such a the system will be connected to the to the distribution grid. So uh, that's here that we will need maybe either some reinforcement or maybe some additional storage system to to mitigate the 
the troubles for the, the contingency for the for the grid. And uh, regarding to the question number three, uh, so and uh, eventually a preference for V2G between uh, an individual EV and a group of EV. Uh, in fact, it depends on uh, uh, if considering uh, the services for distribution, it will depend uh, on the minimum uh, power that you will have to bid. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, we, uh, we if we observe the, what happened in UK, uh, where you have some uh, call for tenders for, uh, for the flexibility use in uh, distribution, you can see that uh, the minimum bid for uh, flexibility uh, in uh, medium voltage is uh, roughly uh, 50 kilowatts, and uh, for flexibility in low voltage width, it is roughly 10 kilowatts. Uh, so if you consider uh, medium voltage and uh, 50 kilowatt of minimum bid, it will mean that we, you will need uh, maybe uh, seven, eight uh, vehicles uh, if you have a charging point of uh, seven kilowatt, for example. Mm -hmm. That is a common, that can be a common value for low power system. And uh, also, uh, may, we can also consider that the advantage of, uh, of the aggregation it will be uh, the reduction of the risk regarding to the non-availability of uh, the vehicles and uh, non-availability of the battery. So, and also uh, and the, the aggregator will make the, the link between the op grid operator and the users. So as a user, you, you, you will not have to, to make this link directly with the, uh, with the market platform. So, in that case, it can be interesting to, to enable the, um, uh, the development of such services for the users. It can be interesting to, re to um, finally to minimize uh, the task that has to be done by the users. For the users, it must be as most as possible transparent. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, working with an aggregator that will manage the, a group of EV probably it uh, did better. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now we will uh, move to the next slide. Thank and uh, questions are for Professor Willett Kempton. So you can address the questions. You're muting me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir, we can hear yes, you. We can hear. Okay. Um, so first question, what will the effect on battery life if charged and discharged frequently? Uh, so the effect on battery life, it's often believed that the life of the battery is degraded by the number of kilowatt hours flowing through the so-called throughput. Uh, that's not really the primary effect. The primary effects on battery life are shelf life, how long since it was manufactured, and the, the the amount of time spent at the high or low state of charge. Uh, so there's some very good work by Chalmers University in the last year on this, a very extensive testing at different states of charge. Uh, it's a huge uh, effect. So uh, two to three orders of magnitude more wear if you're at 98% charged versus 50 or 40 or 60% charge. Um, so the effect on battery life if it's charged and discharged frequently is very small if you stay near the middle of the state of charge. <clears throat> to answer that question, you stay near the edges, nearly full or nearly empty, it has a very bad effect <clears throat> of reducing life. <clears throat> uh, just as an example, Honda uh, tested battery life based on uh, providing PJM services uh, in the uh, University of Delaware uh, example that, that we showed. Uh, and uh, they found that uh, most uh, usage, the usage of the car and wear over time uh, would reduce the capacity of their battery by 8%. And adding V to G in addition to that added an extra 2% of wear. So, it's a measurable effect, 
but it's very small. Uh, second, what is the effect of fast charging of EV on the stability of the power grid? Uh, well, I, I think actually Professor Petit talked about this a, a bit more than I did, but uh, it, uh, it does, as he suggested, and I totally agree, uh, make it a bit harder to manage. If you have fast charging, that means you're suddenly getting instead of a you know a so-called level two charger, which might be seven or ten or nineteen kilowatts. Uh, instead, you have a fifty to three hundred fifty kilowatt charge that appears suddenly. Uh, car drives in, plugs in. All of a sudden, you have an extra uh, three hundred fifty kilowatts. If you imagine a sort of typical petrol station uh, with um, you know, let's say just three pumps, you know, three times 350, that's a megawatt. You know, three cars come in and you plug in, it's a megawatt. And now let's say a big, a petrol station with 30 pumps. You could have 10 megawatts coming on and off to charge vehicles. This is a major effect on the power grid. So I think this question, the second question is quite important. And it makes me wonder whether these sort of very high power uh, chargers will be economically viable. That is, I may have to put in many millions of dollars of uh, distribution equipment and lines in order to service a typical refilling station with just eight or 10 uh, chargers. Um, <clears throat> so it will have an effect, it'll have to be understood, and uh, it, it may mean that we don't really even want to go to 350 kilowatts in terms of economics. If it's only for Porsches, maybe we can charge lots of money every time they fill up and it, it's possible economically. But for ordinary people, maybe that's not a practical cost-effective way to have extra fast charging. Uh, you know, maybe a 50 kilowatt charger or a 100 kilowatt charger, but maybe not a 350 kilowatt charger. And then lastly, why does the distributor of EVs not cover VG under their guarantee? I think that's uh, the warranty on the vehicle, I think is what's intended here. And they do, as I, as I mentioned. For example, all those Nissans that you saw in Denmark, the UK, uh, those are fully warranty. The battery is fully warranty for VG use and for driving. Um, then the last part of this third question, do EV sellers in the U.S. cover VG in their guarantee? Uh, right now, we have no U.S. light vehicle sellers that cover it. The heavy vehicle sellers do. So uh, the buses that you saw in the pictures on the truck, uh, those, are, uh, those are set up to do VG and they're not, uh, there's no effect on the warranty. Uh, so uh, I think it's a little bit of a misconception that it will always be a, an effect on the warranty. But it does require the OEM, the manufacturer, to study and make sure that it's not reducing their battery life. So it takes them a little while to do that and understand it fully. Um, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily a major problem. The bigger problems are the ones that I went through uh, and, and Professor Petit also summarized of the, the various policy items on, on our lists. <clears throat> So those are my answers to those questions. I guess I'll just add one thing on the previous question of inertia. We are seeing uh, markets for inertia already uh, coming in. Uh, there's none, I think, that are actually paying money yet. But uh, Energinet DK, for example, the Danish TSO, uh, National Grid, the, uh, uh, the uh, UK TSO, those are um, planning synthetic inertia, that is, uh, that that means really doesn't necessarily look like a mechanical inertia. Rather, it's very fast response when there's an instability on the system, uh, so that it would, might be a requirement of response of uh, 300 micro, uh, milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, for example. <clears throat> so that's uh, those are all of my answers. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Willard Kempton. Uh, after started this question and answer round, we received some four or five more questions. If time permits, we can take those questions, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, both the professors and the chairman, uh, Mr. Pillai, uh, we all can, you all can take a call if we can answer, address more questions.
there after we'll see sorry so we couldn't hear you completely i said we'll uh, continue with the valerian we are already out of time so let uh, valerian complete your speech and a word of thanks and thereafter we'll take up the questions you can sure sir. sure uh, now i would like to invite miss valerie and for the closing remarks and vote of thanks miss valerie and is currently the managing director of think smart grids france she is also uh, she is a communication and executive mba graduate she has worked and led as a communication director in various public structures she joined the energy sector 20 years ago as a communication director of the main nuclear power plant in europe situated in the northern part of the france <coughs> she has worked on the expansion of edf group communication and brand in poland hungary and continental countries she was union union nationally elected as the vice chairperson of of gsgf uh, on 11th july 2019 now i would like to invite ms kan to please address the audience and share vote of thanks thank you thank you very much uh, can you hear me yes we can hear you ma'am Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you to all our esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, especially, I want to to thank uh, Professor Willard Campton from the University of Delaware and Mark Petit for their insights and for all the knowledge they've been providing to us today. So, um, for, for example, um, we've been really appreciating uh, Mr. Campton. that you explained uh, this concept of grid integrated vehicle system and also that you you gave us some uh, very concrete example about the uh, economical benefits of uh, of the um, ev uh, especially in order to understand uh, how they can be competitive with with uh, other storage uh, uh, processes and dispositives So this is very uh, very interesting for us. Uh, thank you very much also to to you, Professor Marc Petit. So um, Marc, you you've been working for many many months on this uh, report that has been released today by the Global uh, Smart Energy Federation, uh, and um, I think it was. not obvious at all to 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 work with different nationalities and to make some comparison on such an innovative uh, topic so thank you very much so we all understand that today uh, the electrical mobility uh, can be a, a cornerstone in the fight against climate change but without transmission and distribution grids uh, this will not happen at all so it is a combination of both electro mobility and grids that can make a real change for the uh, energy transition today was also taking place the first world solar technology summit in india so it shows how urgent and important uh, are the renewable energy topic as well as the ev topic uh, today uh, in the world uh to 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 finish i just want to say that we at global uh, smart uh, energy federation will continue to work on all these topics uh which are placing the utilities at the very heart of the fight against uh, climate change so once again uh, thank you for being with us uh, today and uh, hope to to hear you or to see you again maybe at the next uh, indian smart utility week <laughs> we hope we hope uh, the next uh, year march program is going to be physical god willing otherwise it's also going to be on digital platform uh, in, in fact digital platforms are quite becoming acceptable across the world many Uh, programs we attend where there are 800 people 2000 people on digital platforms as we speak as you mentioned the correctly valerian uh, the first solar technology summit by international solar alliance is going on 
uh, concurrently it started half an hour before one hour before us it will go on for another three hours so uh, we lost a lot of audience because of that but they, uh, nevertheless our recorded uh, video link will be mailed to all the registered participants along with the presentation deck the main report which we released today is all on our website which can be downloaded so uh, sneha you can present if there are uh, some important questions we'll take up uh, quickly we are only five minutes late sure sir i'll share my meeting screen and i'll share the chat Maybe if you allow me, I just have one question to Professor Houghton. Uh, you've been showing us some uh, uh, examples that happen in Delaware. Are there other examples that are available in other states uh, of, uh, of America in order that you can quote us? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, so the um, state of New York, as you've seen, uh, also school buses uh, experimentally. It's not a you know sort of commercial product that's expanding. Uh, the state of Virginia has announced that they will require over a period of time all school buses to be electric, and the expectation is that they will all be vehicle to grid capable. Um, those aren't all deployed yet, uh, but that's the uh, intention. Uh, the uh, state of California has uh, maybe four different uh, vehicle to grid projects. Uh, that's where Nuvi's headquarters are, so they are operating those, those projects. Um, those are the ones that are already, you know, with electric vehicles that do V to G on the on the ground and you know and and active, as well as the one in Delaware. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Now I'm sharing my meeting window so that everyone can see the questions. First question I've highlighted. The question is how we can uh, mitigate the uh, uh, mitigation of power quality issues. How we can issue uh, mitigate the issues of power quality. Regarding to power quality, uh, if I can uh, respond, uh, um, you have several criteria, finally, of power quality. Uh, you have voltage uh, drop issues. You have, um, uh, you have uh, unbalanced uh, voltage issues, for example. And uh, regarding to, for example, to voltage drop, uh, you can imagine that uh, the converter that is embedded into in the vehicles uh, can be used to uh, to exchange, so either to deliver or to absorb reactive power with the grid, as the reactive power is a mean to uh, to manage the the voltage in the grid. And uh, if we consider the the low voltage grid where we mainly have uh, one single phase loads. In that case, uh, it, need, it needs, uh, it requires um, a very smart uh, management of the electric vehicles to uh, find and, to, and the, flexible, the flexibility of the vehicles to, uh, to try to improve the, uh, the unbalance and to reduce the voltage unbalance. So it is something that uh, theoretically, something is possible, uh, but it, re it will require um, uh, some more measurements, more data uh, about the low voltage grid. And for that, uh, in the future, you will have the development of uh, of what we call state estimator that will that will help the the DSO to have a, a better overview of what happened on the on the low voltage grid. Because presently, the, the low voltage grid are mainly operated in a fit and forget um, approach, finally. And uh, in the future, when you will get some, when you have some state measure, more measurements and state estimators, you, it will be possible to have a, a better view of, of what happened. And then it will be possible to have a, a, a more uh, 
a specific control of the vehicles to, uh, to manage the, the imbalance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mark Petit. Uh, can we take two more questions, two or three more questions? Uh, two more. The, 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 it's already 10 minutes late, so you take this one, uh, and the rest of them we will answer in writing to the people. You can save the chat box. Sure, sure, sir. So the next question I've already highlighted, which is for protection equipment in the grid to be working as intended, the introduction of EV, does it require new design of protection design or this is the only this is only a concern of V2G? I, I could answer that. Uh, yes, please. It's okay. only a concern of V2G. It's not a concern of managed charging. Uh, managed charging is just a load. Uh, you know, you just are turning things on and off or adjusting the amount of load. Um, so there, it's just a matter of overload. Um, uh, for V to G, uh, this is just vaguely referring to protection regime and protection equipment. But really, uh, there are many, many uh, devices on the grid which feed power into the grid. The most common, of course, are. I'm so sorry, uh, so you're on mute. You went on mute just five seconds back. Oh. Oh. Now we can hear you, sir. You can hear me now? Yep. Yeah. I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't touch anything, so I'm not sure why that changed to you. Um, so uh, did, did, you, did you hear the solar example? So they, uh, with solar energy, we're feeding the photovoltaics behind the meter. We're feeding power to the grid. So that's all for well managed and you know, regulated. It doesn't require anything very special beyond what we have now. So it's really the same thing when you're doing vehicle to grid. And, uh, and some of the regulations that I was talking about are addressing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, so we have answered two questions and we will be going ahead and uh, closing the session. Regis, if you would like to speak something. You're on mute, sir. So you yeah, are unmuted. We can yeah, hear you. We are already 12 minutes behind schedule and it is still afternoon in France and Europe. It's more early morning in the US. So we will not uh, upset their schedule. And <laughs> thank you. Th thank you, everybody. And uh, rest of the questions we will uh, answer uh, through email along with the presentations. And uh, good day, good afternoon and uh, good evening. Good night to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>